as part, I mean, outline to strategy. I mean, obviously, non-invasive ventilation is a main approach. We have been discussing in all the interactive sessions as well that we try to use non-invasive mode in the appropriate way. And which mode of non-invasive ventilation you'd use is up to you as well. Early and effective use of pressure. Uh, so if a baby needs, uh, if a baby has a respiratory distress, don't start with just low flow oxygen because you have a low complaints lung. The baby's having recession, stachypnea. If you start with just pressure, it's uh, just oxygen, it's not going to help the baby. So start with heated humidified gas, either through CPAP or high flow. And uh, you are able to be flexible with how much pressure you need and titrate. Your oxygen delivery is as per the saturation. So never use without blender. We discussed that again. So never use any pressure in the newborn baby without a blender. You only give as much oxygen as you need. Give enough pressure so that your need for oxygen is cut out as well. Volume trauma and atelectotrauma are both harmful. And uh, we have to be cautious with the use of high flow as a primary therapy. We will discuss that again with Dr. Karthik's lecture. So there are studies which show that high flow works well, but your flexibility is limited because you can only go to a certain peep with that. You can't measure the peep as well. So yeah, as a primary modality, you have limitations better to use with CPAP or NAPPV. And synchronized forms of NAPPV are beneficial in reducing the need for mechanical ventilation. But don't worry if you don't have synchronization, it still works. And in case of preterm babies with RDS, consider early surfactant therapy if the FAO2 is rising more than 0.4 in the bigger babies and 0.3 in the smaller babies if you have used adequate pressure on NAV. We don't use very high pressures on NAV before surfactant <coughs> because needing like 6 to 7 CPAP or NAPP pressure of 18 to 20 is enough to show that the baby has stiff lungs and you need surfactant. So you may cause a pneumothorax if you delay it too much. So time it appropriately. If you, are, if you have limitation in surfactant availability, you may have to manage with NAV facing the risk of pneumothorax. Be prepared for that. But Again, you can titrate your target oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in those settings. And consider non-invasive form of surfactant therapy. We had the recent discussion in the OCS as well. So Insure or LISA can be used. Adequate PEEP is important. Open lung strategy even for invasive or non-invasive as well as high frequency ventilation. You want to be in the optimum zone of the pressure volume curve loop. Avoid uh, hypocarbia and avoid hypercarbia as well. Use permissive capnia with caution according to the age of the baby. Minimize the period on mechanical ventilation. So always look at extubation plan, uh, whether the baby needs to be on the tube, start weaning, avoid sedation so that you can extubate. Any uh, spontaneous extubation, consider it as an opportunity to try non-invasive. We have the lecture on extubation. I hope you have all uh, watched that as well. So I mentioned the optimum zone. So we have the safe window. And you have the principle of hysteresis, which applies to invasive and non-invasive ventilation as well as high frequency. So once you have achieved the optimal lung distension, you can drop the pressure without any drop in the volume to a certain level. So use the function of hysteresis to drop your pressures once you reach the optimal volume. That way, your chance of over distending the lung when the lung complaints is improving also reduces. So you are keeping pace with the baby and also one step ahead. And of course, if your oxygen requirement starts rising, you know that you wean too much, then you can go back to the previous setting. And allow the nurses to increase the pressure slightly after suction or after handling. And also the FAO2, if it starts going high, they need to alert you. So all this education within the team should happen as well. So, uh, so in terms of outline to strategy, the synchronized modes, uh, preferably volume guarantee should be used. And assist control can be more effective in the acute phase. But again, don't be dogmatic about using assist control. If the rate goes high, you have a higher chance of uh, both volume trauma and CO2 washout. SAMV or assist control with PS can be used. Uh, and we mentioned this. Hypocapnia can be an issue where the auto-triggering is happening. And monitor changes in lung complaints and wean pressures, so preferably with volume guarantee. And NAVA can be used in select babies as well. And we will discuss high frequency tomorrow. I mean, it's mainly used as a rescue modality by most of us, though some units use it as a primary modality. In PPHN, nitric oxide uh, is shown to be more beneficial when you use it with high frequency or more effective when you use it with high frequency because the lung needs to be open well. 
and uh, as a primary modality we have some limitations you may need sedation more than you need with conventional the unit familiarity uh, you need more intense nursing care so if the nursing numbers are limitations and uh, we will discuss the lung recruitment uh, strategy as well tomorrow so to conclude uh, ventilation is an art as well as a science so this is more a summary of what you have been learning in the whole module so uh, it's not about one single parameter. Understanding the pathophysiology of the disease is very important. Starting with the non-invasive in appropriate way, not just giving oxygen, giving the pressure, uh, not hesitating to move to the next level of support in a timely manner, a surfactant within non less invasive or ventilation and making the choice carefully. I mean, if you have a CO2 of 70 or a baby is a 26 weaker, you may go for intubation and ventilation rather than LISA, uh, depending on your unit expertise as well. I mean, of course, there is no hard and fast rules there, but you need to make a decision which is in favor of the baby as well. You don't want to handle the baby unnecessarily. You don't want the baby to go through trauma from repeated intubation attempts. And in majority of the ventilated babies, sensible use of the commonly available modes is adequate. And uh, don't forget to review the baby carefully clinically and uh, blood gases, titrate it as you need it. Don't have a set pattern, minimal use of blood gas to guide. Mostly we have the oxygenation, the pressure settings, early extubation. Non-invasive ventilation, blood gas doesn't offer too much information. So you may need to document one per day or so in the beginning, but uh, you can titrate. No need to do repeated gases for every change you do on non-invasive ventilation, whether it's NAPPV or CPAP, you can go by the work of breathing and the oxygen. So uh, obviously ventilators are advanced, but we are still needed to make Artificial intelligence may come up and it may change that, but obviously we are still the decision makers and we are the ones who need to be favorable to the baby's management. So I think uh, we have coffee break now, right? Yeah. So one online question from Dr. Deepika De. Yeah. Any relationship of PEEP and weight of the baby? What should the PEEP be for less than one kg baby? I mean, five to six is standard for uh, irrespective of the size of the baby. But if the baby shows tendency to electrotrauma, you can go a six as standard for the smaller babies. So if you start with five to six for both groups, it's okay. If you want to start with six for the smaller babies because there is a higher chance of closing down, that's acceptable as well. But beyond six, usually we don't start with it. There are some situations and in BPD, with the chronic BPD babies, the PEEP, there is no limit. You go to even 10 to 14 PEEP if there is a tracheomalacia, for example, but that's not a common scenario and that needs to come from your consultant. So it needs to be an expert decision. Then should we increase the volume 40% or? No, no, volume guarantee needs you to measure the tidal volume appropriately. So if the leak is exceeding 40 to 50%, you may not rely on what is being measured. So you're not going to use volume guarantee beyond 50% leak. So 40 to 50% is a gray zone. You need to make the call depending on how the baby is. And the leak compensation is automatic or you need to request it automatic. So the leak compensation is automatic as well. That's why we say up to 50% you can allow. Okay. Just uh, speak in the mic so that the online people can hear. In case of severe RDS, what maximum PIP we can go up to? Like, especially if we have given one surfactant and still lungs are bad and still we, want, we are planning to give second dose till the time the baby is desaturating. So maximum, how much PIP we can See, I mean, this is a very good question. And this is a question that comes back to the question of, is there something called barotrauma? If you speak to Dr. Martin Kessler, he will say that there is no barotrauma. It's not the pressure that's damaging, it's the lung opening. So if you don't open the lung adequately, uh, you won't re achieve ventilation. So, but it needs close monitoring. If you are increasing the pressure beyond a certain level to open the lung. So here you need to look at why exactly the lung isn't opening. And you may need to use a recruitment maneuver on high frequency early rather than waiting to use very high pressures. It's not going to work step by step 20, 22, 24, you go up to 30. We have used 35, 40 pressures, but the better strategy in these babies, you know the recruitment strategy we will discuss tomorrow as well. You go to high frequency, you keep going up in steps based on the FAO2, you understand? So the recruitment maneuver is you go up in steps of two or three, you go by the FAO2 and as the FAO2 starts reducing to a certain level of say 30 to 40%, you keep going up on the pressure. So this is high frequency recruitment strategy because here it's a map. It's not, the shear stress is not going to be as much. 
The problem with the very high pressure on conventional is the shear stress because the gap between the pip and the peep is very high. It's going to go back and forth. But you're right, if the lung is not open, nothing helps the baby. So quickly switch to after the surfactant dose that you gave, if your baby is not responding, don't delay too long. Make sure the tube is really in the airway. I mean, you don't have the carbon dioxide sensor. Sometimes we have the tube in the esophagus, even though we think it's in the airway. So you can visualize with the laryngoscope if you don't have the carbon dioxide sensor. So the calorimeter we discussed last time as well. It's a big plus for such babies where you confirm again, the tube can slip even, even though the outside fixing is correct, inside the mouth they can extubate. So baby can push with the tongue and the tube slips out of the airway into the esophagus. So if you use a calorimeter as a first step, if the lung doesn't open despite high pressures, is the tube really in the airway? If the tube is in the airway, then you go for the high frequency ventilation to recruit.